ready to journey back in time with me to 1920. We're talking post-Russian Revolution, a moment buzzing with hope and, let's be honest, more than a little chaos. And who better to guide us through this historical maze than Bertrand Russell? He went to Russia, notebook in hand, expecting to find. Well, we'll get to that. Exactly. We're diving into his book, The Practice and Theory of Bolshevism, where he holds nothing back. It's like getting a backstage pass with someone who isn't afraid to call it as they see it. And what he saw, often firsthand, was a stark contrast between the dreamy ideals of Bolshevism and the often harsh realities on the ground. Imagine the whispers across Europe, the Bolsheviks. They were going to change everything. A new world order. Everyone was holding their breath. But then Russell gets there and it's like, hold on a second. So what gave him that wait a minute moment? What was so different from what everyone thought was happening? It was like watching a play where the actors were way off script. The Bolsheviks, they mastered the art of propaganda. They preach equality, but their actions, well, that's a whole other story. <laughs> All talk, no action. I can't stand that. Okay, but give us an example. Where did their words and their actions really clash? Take the word dictatorship. They threw it around a lot, but not in some abstract theoretical sense. No, they meant it. You're kidding. They were just straight up like, yeah, we're in charge. Deal with it. <laughs> Pretty much. Then there's the word proletariat, the working class, the backbone of the revolution, right? Except when they said proletariat, they didn't mean everyone. Ah, uh, here it comes, that whole Pickwickian sense thing. Russell loved that phrase. He did, didn't he? It's basically a fancy way of saying they were twisting the meaning to fit their narrative. Think of it like someone saying, let's agree to disagree with a sly smirk on their face. You know something's up. Okay, I'm seeing the disconnect here. So when the Bolsheviks talked about the proletariat, who are they really referring to? Think smaller, much smaller. They were really only talking about themselves, the Communist Party elite. Everyone else, not so much. Wow, talk about controlling the message. So this wasn't some happy unified revolution. Not quite. In fact, this whole us versus them mentality reminded Russell of other groups throughout history, the Puritans under Cromwell, so stripped, so severe. And then there was the French Directoire, another revolution, another power grab. So not exactly known for their wild parties then. Seriously, though, what was the common thread Russell was picking up on with these comparisons? He saw this pattern of trying to force people to live by a certain moral code, a standard that most just wouldn't or couldn't maintain. Human nature, it's a tricky thing. Definitely not a recipe for long-term success. And speaking of not living up to those lofty ideals, Russell had some interesting observations about the Communist Party leaders themselves. Weren't they all about equality, sharing the wealth, that sort of thing? You would think so. But Russell, he saw firsthand how these high-ranking party members lived. He noted the stark contrast, the comfortable homes, their control of resources, they even had cars, something most Russians couldn't even dream of owning back then. Talk about rubbing in everyone's faces. Imagine struggling to put food on the table and then seeing these guys cruising around in their fancy cars. Did Russell mention how ordinary people felt about that kind of disparity? Oh, he did. He talked about this growing resentment, especially in the cities. People weren't stupid. They could see the hypocrisy. And I'm guessing they couldn't just post about it on social media or complain to their local newspaper. Russell mentions this Extraordinary Commission. What was that all about? Ah, uh, yes. The Extraordinary Commission, think of them as the Bolsheviks' secret police. They had the power to silence anyone they deemed a threat, no questions asked. Not exactly the best way to win hearts and minds, is it? So much for freedom of speech. All right, let's shift gears a bit. What about art? Did the Bolsheviks even care about that kind of stuff? That's where things get interesting. On a surface, they claim to support the arts. They preserve traditional art forms, but they also ushered in a very specific style. Okay, I have to ask, was it just endless portraits of Lenin everywhere? Pretty much. Propaganda became the name of the game, and they weren't exactly subtle about it. Imagine pre-revolution Russian art, vibrant, diverse, full of life. Now picture that being replaced by this very rigid, very controlled style all about glorifying the revolution and its leaders. So instead of art for art's sake, it became art for the party's sake. Exactly. And sadly, this control, this desire to shape the narrative, it extended to their education system as well. Uh-oh. I always get nervous when someone talks about controlling education. And for good reason. Now on the surface, some of the reforms sounded promising. They embraced things like Montessori education, hands-on learning. They even emphasized the arts. But Russell saw the bigger picture, and it wasn't pretty. There's always a catch, isn't there? What set off alarm bells for Russell? 
He worried they were more interested in churning out obedient workers than free thinkers. Instead of fostering critical thinking and individual expression, they were replacing it with a heavy dose of communist doctrine. It's almost as if they wanted to create a generation that wouldn't or couldn't question anything. You've hit the nail on the head. And this, I think, gets to the heart of Russell's critique. They claim to be a democracy, a government for the people, but their actions told a different story. That whole dictatorship of the proletariat thing wasn't exactly a subtle hint. Not at all. And that's where things start to unravel, both in the cities and the countryside. It's a classic case of easier said than done, isn't it? Building a utopia is a messy business, and one of the messiest parts, the economy. Yeah, those Bolsheviks, they really seem to struggle with that whole money makes the world go round thing. It's almost as if they underestimated just how important incentives are. Think about their policies on agriculture aimed at empowering the working class, but they kind of missed the mark. Remember all that talk about the worker being the hero of the revolution? Workers of the world unite. It had a nice ring to it. Catchy, wasn't it? But then they implement these policies that basically eliminate private property, collectivize everything. Sounds great in theory, right? Yeah. Share the wealth. Everyone works together. And what could go wrong? Well, they forgot to factor in a little thing called human motivation. See, if you're a farmer and you know that no matter how hard you work, you're not going to reap any extra rewards, well... You'd be like, why bother? Exactly. And guess what happened? Food shortages. Big ones. Mm. Especially in the cities. People were hungry. They were angry. And I'm guessing they weren't too thrilled with the whole let him eat cake vibe from the Bolsheviks. Not so much. This is where the whole dictatorship of the proletariat thing starts to ring a little hollow, don't you think? Yeah, because a true worker's paradise probably involves, you know, not starving. <laughs> Funny how that works. And speaking of contradictions, let's not forget about the industrial sector, which, let's be honest, was already a bit of a mess before the revolution. They weren't exactly inheriting a well-oiled machine. So how did the Bolsheviks' policies play out in the factories? This is where it gets really interesting, because... Russell, ever the astute observer, he picked up on this glaring hypocrisy. The Bolsheviks, they railed against forced labor under capitalism, right? Called it exploitation, oppression, all the bad things. Right, because forcing people to work against their will is so 19th century. Exactly. But then what do they end up implementing? Forced labor. Ironic, isn't it? So they became the very thing they swore to destroy. That's and kind of embarrassing. Yes, it's almost comical if it weren't so tragic, but... That was their logic, you see. They argued that every economic system in history, slavery, feudalism, capitalism, they all relied on some form of coercion to function. So they felt justified in continuing the trend, just with a new revolutionary twist. And talk about missing the forest for the trees. It's like they skipped over that whole breaking the chains of oppression part of their mission statement. It's almost as if they forgot what they were fighting for in the first place. And the language they used to justify it was even more striking. They called it labor compulsion, even right. went so far as to talk about the militarization of production. Yeah. It was all very well. Intense. A little too Big Brother-ish. Exactly. And this gets to another crucial aspect of Russell's critique, one that I think is often overlooked. He understood that you can't just change the economic system and expect human nature to magically transform overnight. He gets it. Hmm. We're creatures of habit, driven by all sorts of weird, wonderful, and often... Let's face it, selfish impulses. Precisely. And the Bolsheviks, they seem to think that by eliminating private property, they could somehow erase all those messy human desires. Ambition, competition, the need for recognition. They were trying to create a society where everyone was perfectly selfless, mm -hmm. always working for the common good. It was a lovely thought, but well, naive. just a tad. And Russell, being a student of both philosophy and psychology, he saw right through it. He understood that even in a supposedly classless society, power dynamics would still emerge. Because someone always wants to be top dog. Right. It's human nature. And Russell even went so far as to suggest that maybe, just maybe, psychoanalysis, this newfangled science of the mind, might offer a more accurate understanding of political behavior than the purely economic lens of Marxism. So he's saying that understanding the inner workings of our minds, our motivations, our hangups, that's just as important as understanding the economic forces at play. Exactly. And this is where Russell's critique moves beyond mere political disagreement. He's challenging their entire worldview, their belief that they had all the answers. Because when you're convinced you have all the answers, it's easy to dismiss anyone who disagrees with you as, well, the enemy. A dangerous game indeed. 
And that's what Russell saw happening in Russia. He witnessed firsthand how revolutionary ideals, however noble they may start out, can be twisted and corrupted by power. Power corrupts? Absolutely. Power corrupts absolutely. It's a tale as old as time. But the question is, is there a different path, a way to create a more just and equitable society without resorting to oppression and violence? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? And thankfully, Bertrand Russell had some thoughts on that as well. OK, so we've dug into Russell's critique, but... Was he all doom and gloom? Did he offer any solutions? Well, he wasn't just going to leave us hanging. Russell, he was a true idealist at heart. He believed in the possibility of a better world. But he also recognized that the path to get there, well, it wasn't going to be paved with revolutions and dictatorships. So no more storming the Winter Palace. Not if we want lasting change. Russell believed in a more nuanced, more thoughtful approach. And it all started with education. OK, education. Always a good place to start. But we're not just talking about memorizing multiplication tables here. It's definitely not. For Russell, education wasn't about indoctrination. It was about empowering people to think for themselves, to question assumptions, to challenge authority. He wanted to create a society full of critical thinkers, not blind followers. Because a society full of yes men, that's a recipe for disaster. So education is key. But what else did he emphasize? The diffusion of power. He'd seen what happened when power gets too concentrated, too centralized, whether it's in the hands of a king, a dictator, or even a political party. Let me guess, it doesn't usually end well. You got it. Power corrupts, and absolute power. Well, that corrupts absolutely. That's why Russell was such a strong advocate for decentralization. He believed in giving individuals and communities more control over their own lives, more say in the decisions that directly affect them. So power to the people, but maybe with a bit less, you know, guillotining this time. Exactly. He was a strong advocate for democracy, but he also understood that democracy is fragile. It requires an informed citizenry, a vigilant public, and a healthy dose of skepticism towards those in power. Okay, so education, diffusion of power, anything else on Russell's checklist for a better world? This next one might sound a bit radical even today. He believed that in addition to political and social reforms, we also need to explore new scientific approaches to understanding and perhaps even influencing human behavior. Hold on, are we talking about mind control now? Not quite mind control. But he was fascinated by the emerging field of psychology and its potential to shed light on our more destructive tendencies, our capacity for violence, greed, tribalism. He wondered if maybe, just maybe, science could help us become more rational, more empathetic, more cooperative. So like a software update for the human brain. Something like that. Although he was also acutely aware of the potential dangers of such interventions, especially if they fell into the wrong hands. Yeah, because who gets to decide what a better human even looks like? Mm -hmm. That's a whole other can of worms. It is indeed. But Russell, he never shied away from asking the tough questions. Because for him, the stakes were just too high. He'd seen firsthand the horrors that humans are capable of inflicting on one another, and he believed that we owed it to ourselves and to future generations to explore every avenue for creating a more just, more peaceful, and ultimately more humane world. And that, my friends, is something we can all get behind. Bertrand Russell, everyone. Philosopher, activist, and dare I say, a bit of an optimist, even in the face of revolution and turmoil. Well, that's it for our deep dive into Russell's world. A big thanks to our expert for guiding us through this fascinating and sometimes unsettling chapter of history. Until next time, keep questioning, keep exploring, and keep those thinking caps firmly fastened.